My name is Scott Parker. I am also from the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. Uh, I'm the lead for the performance engineering team. So that team today is about a dozen people that focus on HPC technologies and applications and basically try to make sure that all the machines that we put on the floor at Argonne work successfully for our user community, for people like you in the room. Um, and so that involves a lot of understanding of the low-level architecture of our existing machines and also working with vendors on our future machines. Um, so today what I want to do is, is talk a little bit about the hardware that we have, um, what's coming up, and I want to do that in the context of talking about Theta because I know you guys will be using Theta um, a bit this week, and I want to kind of give you some you know, architectural insight to what makes, you know, what constitutes Theta. So we'll talk about the system architecture, processor architecture, uh, and the network architecture, all sort of in brief because there's really not a lot of time to go into any of those in depth. Um, and then I also want to talk about what's coming next. And um, so this is, you know, the title of the talk is Theta and the Future of Accelerated Programming at Argonne. And as, as Mike already told you, um, you know, Theta is the last on our, our line of um, CPU-based machines. So, so the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility has been around for about a decade or so. Actually, now I take that back. We've been about almost 15 years now. Um, and, and really it sort of had its root, recent roots uh, in computing at Argonne back in 2005 when we got our first rack of BlueGene L. BlueGene was sort of a very HPC specific architecture that IBM had developed back in the early 2000s. Uh, and it's been a very successful one for us here at Argonne. And in fact, this year we're retiring Mira, the last of our Blue Jean line, which is sad for a number of us. Um, but you know, we started here with uh, Blue Jean L, and this wasn't really a big machine, and you can see it's 5.6 teraflops. All right, that was you know, just one rack, but it was a full cabinet. You can get that much on a single chip today, right? So you, know, you can see the changes. In 2008, we had 40 racks of Blue Jean P. So this is the second generation of the Blue Jean, and that was half a petaflop. Um, and today we're kind of, you know, in the 10 to 12 petaflop era, still at Argonne, um, with our Mira system, which was a Blue Gene Q, the third and last in the line of Blue Genes. Um, and we then had a plan to move on to uh, Intel uh, Xeon Phi architecture, which is also a many core architecture. So all these processors, all these machines were many core. And back in 2005, many core constituted two cores. So that was a lot of cores back then. Um, we moved on to uh, four cores with Blue Gene P and 16 cores with Mira. Now, 16 cores doesn't sound like a lot today, but back when Mira first came online in 2012, that was the most cores you could get anywhere, pretty much on a single chip. Um, with the Xeon Phi, we were at 64 cores. Uh, unfortunately, the many core route has kind of run out of steam, and Intel decided not to make the next generation of Xeon Phi. So we had hoped to have a, 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 this year in production a, a KNH, a Knights Hill many core machine that would look a lot like Theta. Um, but Intel had, you know, changed their product roadmap and is no longer going to make that. However, they are going to be making. Um, GPUs, uh, discrete GPUs, uh, similar to what NVIDIA and AMD make these days. And so in 2021, we will be deploying, which as Mike indicated, we hope to have be the world's or at least the nation's first exaflop machine here at Argonne. And that's going to be based on uh, you know, these Intel GPUs. And, and I think what we've seen is that you know, we've had a nice run with the many core architecture um, design, but really it's kind of become increasingly challenging to, to go with the many core route for a large scale HPC, and the real reason is power. Um, I think Mike talked about some of the power numbers. Uh, when we get to Aurora, we're looking at 40 megawatts of power uh, on a GPU, which is pretty much the most energy efficient architecture at the moment. And uh, 40 megawatts, just to give you some context, it costs us about a million dollars a year for a megawatt. So at 40 megawatts, we're spending $40 million a year. Um, you know, back when we were running uh, Blue Gene P, we were about one to two megawatts. So you know our power bill went from one to two megawatt, uh, one to two million to forty million, which is a pretty big jump. And you can't keep scaling like that indefinitely. So th something had to change, and this is the shift that we're seeing today. Um, so when I talk about these systems and the future systems, what you're going to see these days is performance from parallelism. That's really what's driving everything. I mean, I think everybody knows that you know, the, the increase in increases in clock rates that we had seen a decade ago, year after year, are just no longer happening. And so the way you get more performance is you have more parallelism. And that parallelism comes from a number of um, 
aspects. So you can have parallelism across nodes. So this is just having more and more nodes, right? You use often MPI to orchestrate this or some other um, communication uh, programming model. So you know, we, with, with Mirror, we have 48,000 nodes, right? And if you wanted, you could put at Oak Ridge, or sorry, at Livermore, they had 96,000 nodes of Blue Gene Q. So they had twice as much uh, performance as we did. Um, so you can always add more nodes in theory and get more performance. Uh, in addition to that, but what you see is not just that, there's parallelism sort of uh, you know, being pulled out all across the system. Um, so you can have parallelism across sockets. So if any of you have run, all of our systems have been single socket systems, but if you've run at Oak Ridge, for instance, you've probably seen they have multi-socket GPU systems. If you run on cluster computers, they're usually dual or quad socket Xeons. So you know, having multiple processors on a single node gives you more performance. Um, then of course, people have been adding cores to the chips, right? So we went from two cores on BlueGNL to four cores on P to 16 cores on Q to 64 cores on Theta. And you know, you, you can keep doing this up to a point, but it, get, it does get more challenging. Um, now, these are, I think, are probably, everybody can see these. It's very obvious in the numbers when you look at the machines. Um, once you start getting down here, these are more microarchitectural details that are equally as important, but they're sort of hidden um, by the programming models or you know, sort of in the low level of the architecture. So, Things like parallelism across pipe, pipelines within each core, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but basically, you know, more, more paths to execute instructions within a core. So in the old days, you had sort of one path. Today, you might have up to six paths or eight paths so that you can be executing six or eight instructions simultaneously within a core. Um, and then within those instructions, they started adding parallelism. So you now have vector instructions, and a vector instruction, in one instruction can do four or eight floating point operations. And so you're trying to push you know, parallelism down there. Um, and then you even have instructions that can do multiple things simultaneously. So there's a thing called a floating point multiply add. So one instruction will multiply two numbers together and then add them to a third number. So, you know, that, that's doing sort of two floating point operations with one instruction. And if you do that in a SIMD context, you can get 16 floating point operations from one single instruction. And so this is the parallelism. This is kind of driving everything. Um, and, and this is what GPUs are sort of really good at expressing is a lot of parallelism. The architecture is sort of rooted in that. Um, but it's not the only way you can do it. So Sai is going to talk about um, ARM, and ARM's doing a lot with, you know, long vectors or scalable vector instructions. Um, and they're really kind of probably the ones that are going to drive whatever, you know, whatever goes on in many core computing, most likely uh, in HPC into the next decade or so. Um, but let's take a look at Theta. So Theta is a Cray XC40 system. Uh, it's been around for about three years now. Uh, peak performance is 12 petaflops. Uh, we have 4, 000, a little 4,400 nodes roughly and a little under 300,000 cores. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a Knight's Landing processor, so this was the second generation of the Intel Xeon Phi line, 64 cores, relatively low frequency, you know, one to two gigahertz. It's more power efficient to run at low frequency, so, you know, they're kind of giving up this, you know, speed on an individual task for having a lot of parallelism, um, and that, that's sort of more efficient on a power basis. Memory, we're a little under a uh, petabyte, and one thing that's interesting here is this is the first time, I think, on a, on a regular uh, CPU that you start to see integrated memory. And I'll talk about this a little bit more, this MCD RAM, uh, which is in package memory. So it's memory that's sort of built onto the chip itself, plus the traditional um, you know, DRAM. Uh, we have a Cray Ares interconnect um, with a Dragonfly topology and 10 petabytes of Lustre file system. And so I think everybody here probably has an account or can get an account on Theta uh, if you're using it. And, and if you went and looked at Theta, and I think you guys might go to the machine room later and you'll get a chance to look at it. I just want to give you a little insight as to what you'll see. So if you walk in and look at Theta, what you'll see is 24 cabinets, right? So these are usually very boring. They're just black boxes. They look like big filing cabinets. Um, as I said, we have 4, 000, a little over 4,000 nodes. We have a, um, a, a, over 1,000 switches. So one of the things with these big computing systems is, um, you know, it's not hard to put a lot of flop, flops on the floor. You can just get a lot of, you know, servers and stick them in a room, and that gives you a lot of flops. Getting them to work well and be an integrated HPC system where people can run a simulation at scale and get all those cores working together requires a lot of investment in network technology. And so that's really what makes a supercomputer super, in a sense, is having this strong network um, that lets everything work together. So if you take one of these cabinets and open it up, what you'd find inside is, is three chassis. And I do want to say, um, you know, having worked with some of the vendors for the last few years, 
we don't have a lot of exposure to the, all the complexities and the packaging and cooling and things like that as users, but this is really its own technical area that has a lot of challenges and actually drives a lot of design in these systems. And so what their goal is, is to basically pack as many of these you know, chips into a small area of space as they can and not have it overheat. Um, and then also have it be reliable and fixable if something breaks. Something's always breaking on one of these machines. So you need to be able to get in and pull out a part quickly. And these are water cooled today. So you have all this water running through these systems, right? And you know, water and electricity generally don't mix well together. Um, so you know, if you get a leak anywhere, you can fry your supercomputer, which is not good. So there's a lot of work that's done. Actually, in the I'm a mechanical engineer by training, so maybe that's why I find it interesting. But um, you know, there's a lot of work that's done in the power Cool, power distribution, cooling, and all that. So when you go and see the machine, you know, try to, try to get a sense of some of that. But if you were to open one of the cabinets, you'd see these things called chassis. There's three of them in a uh, chassis. Uh, they'll hold collectively 184 nodes, which gives you about half a petabyte, or ha half a petaflop of performance, which is as much performance as our original Blue Gene P system had back in 2008. So we went from having 40 racks of Blue Gene P that gave us you know, half a petaflop of performance to a single cabinet today that you can do that in, you know. Uh, if you take one of these chassis out, they have 16 blades. Uh, each blade has four uh, nodes on it. So each of these little brown boxes here represents a node. And you'll note there's no fans, there's really no moving parts in any of this. It's all meant to be very reliable and compact. Um, if you pop open one of these nodes, you'd see the Cray Aries chip that uh, makes up a component of the network. And then the k &L itself. So let's take a look at the k &L. So this is a sort of schematic diagram of the, the k &L Knight's Landing processor. Uh, the chip itself is on Intel's 14 nanometer process. So right now, that's still the one Intel's using for a lot of their products. They're going to 10 nanometer. So this year, a lot of their 10 nanometer products will be coming out. Aurora is supposed to be the first chip um, uh, on their seven nanometer process. And so this is what drives these sort of performance and, and scaling improvements is being able to put more transistors on a piece of silicon. So going from 14 to 10 to seven um, is why we can go from having you know, half a petaflop in 40 cabinets to half a petaflop in one cabinet. Uh, unfortunately, this is getting more and more challenging. If anybody's followed the news about what Intel's been doing, one of the reasons they canceled the k &H is because they're really struggling with going from 14 nanometer to 10 nanometer. They're, I think, three years late or something like that on doing that. Um, this used to be like clockwork. Every other year, they were on a new process. And um, as you get smaller and smaller, this gets harder and harder. Um, and so, you know, hopefully they, they, they feel confident they can keep doing this. And we would certainly like to see that because, you know, our, our ability to bring in new machines depends on that to a large degree. Um, so what you see in this diagram here is the blue boxes represent tiles. So a tile has uh, two cores and some cache in it. And you see there's just a big 2D array of these tiles. They're all connected by this 2D mesh. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. But this is what lets the, the t you know, all of the cores on the chip work together and communicate to the memory. So around the periphery, you have the memory. And so you see these orange boxes are this integrated memory or this multi-channel DRAM. Um, these days, that's, you'll see that more often on things they've moved to HBM or high bandwidth memory. It's just a slightly different configuration of this. But this is basically memory that's stacked or connected onto the same chip. And then along the left and right ends, you have the, the DDR memory controller and the DDR channel. So this goes off to your traditional DRAM memory. Um, we have six channels here. And the deal with DRAM is pretty much the more channels you have, the more bandwidth you have. Uh, but as we'll see, ba getting bandwidth um, into a chip these days through these DDR off-chip channels is challenging. And then finally, it's got some integrated on-socket networking. So if you're using an Intel OmniPath network, your network controller um, can actually live, lives right embedded on the chip, and you don't have to have a separate NIC. OK, so just briefly, this is some of the features that uh, you know, Intel thought were interesting innovations when they um, released the, uh, the KNH. So, or, sorry, KNL. Uh, if you'd ever used their previous generation of Xeon Phi processors, they were um, PCI connected devices, so they weren't standalone processors. It was uh, called the Knight's Corner, and just like a graphics card, you'd plug it in and you'd use it as an accelerator. The reason, that, one of the reasons it was like that is actually this, this whole architecture came out of an effort that G Intel was doing to make GPUs out of x86 technology. So they had this project called Larrabee. Larrabee was intended to compete with NVIDIA and those other guys, basically using x86, you know, really small, a lot of small x86 cores 
to uh, you know, do graphics. And I guess that didn't really work, but that sort of moved on to a many core architecture that manifested in Knight's Landing. Um, and so originally it was PCIe connected, but they said, okay, there's no reason this can't be a standalone device. Uh, it runs the same instruction set as Xeon, so that's nice. So if you're on Theta, you know, if you compile a binary on another machine, it will, should generally work on Theta. Um, I would not recommend doing that, but you could if you really wanted to. Um, Intel has a lot of processor architectures and a lot of different processor architecture lines. The one that they built this out of was what they call their Atom line, which was meant for their portable devices. And we saw this with BlueGene. Um, essentially, to get power efficiency, they took these really small lightweight cores that often you would find in a cell phone or even in like a microcontroller that was running the fuel, uh, fuel injection system in your car. And they you know, kind of tweaked it and cobbled it all together and made a supercomputer out of it. And the reason was because those things were designed to be simple and power efficient. And that's what really works here. Um, high vector density. So they got over three teraflops per uh, uh, double precision performance um, from these chips in their like, sort of uh, fastest configuration. So for comparison, you know, around that time, I think the Pascal GPUs were in the five to six teraflop uh, range. So you know, not, not exactly on par, but pretty close. Uh, here they introduced, uh, this is the first product they introduced their AVX512 vector instruction set in. So this lets you do uh, eight floating point operations in a single instruction. Other features that you know, are probably less important to folks, they have a gather scatter engine. Uh, they, as I mentioned, they have this DD, uh, multi-channel DRAM plus DDR, 2D interconnect, and the OmniPath network. So I want to take a look at the interconnect first on the chip. Um, so it's, it's really not, you know, <coughs> Building a mini core chip is not just about putting a lot of cores on the chip. You also have to figure out how to get them all to work together. So it's sort of the same problem in miniature that you have with a big system with the network. You have to get this network on chip. And this sort of starts to look, you know, you see a lot of the same technologies and challenges that you might find on a, on a you know, uh, a regular network connecting nodes, you know, now happening within the chip itself. So each one of these little white boxes is a tile. Each one of these little blue boxes is a connection between the tile and the mesh. And the mesh is 2D, so you know, basically you know, this is like a city grid, right? If you want to route something from this tile to this memory controller, in this instance, their routing scheme was you, know, you go up and down first until you hit the end, then you go left or right until you get to the box that you want to get the data from. So if this tile wants data, you know, it has to send a request up to, let's say, this memory controller here, and then that memory controller sends it back down over to where it came from. And as you can imagine, um, this gets complicated as you add more and more cores, you run into more and more traffic. So this is like, you know, um, you know it looks a lot like downtown Chicago, right? It's a grid of streets. Um, you know, you get to rush hour and no one goes anywhere because everything's blocked up. And that's the problem you can run into on these systems. Um, so they try to make wider lanes, faster streets, more paths. Um, but that, that can be challenging. And so one of the things they did do, uh, and that you can, if you play around with Theta, you can try out is you can put it into these different clustering modes. And the idea here is you try to localize your traffic. You basically say like, well, all the all lets anybody talk to anywhere. So any, tra any tile can originate traffic that goes anywhere. So it's like, you know, free for all, traffic can be a mess. Um, in, in the most constrained modes, subnuma clustering, they basically s divide it into sort of four conceptual subprocessors and all the traffic within a quadrant of the, the chip stays within that quadrant. So if you have a processor over here, it's only going to talk to this memory and only this memory, and it's never going to send messages out to the other components unless you explicitly ask it to. And that can help you with um, performance because you can reduce the congestion on the machine. It's not a big win, but it, it can help. Um, so one of the things just to, if you guys are working on Theta, I have a few um, citations of performance numbers here. They're a little dated. I think they're from about a year and a half. So if anybody wants to, over the course of the week, update these at all or play around with these, I'd be interested to see if you get anything different. I mean, software is always changing. Um, and in particular, this shows um, OpenMP overhead. So OpenMP you know, lets you run a program using multiple cores. Uh, and how efficiently that happens depends on how efficiently, how, how much open, overhead the OpenMP runtime imposes, plus other things related to your code. It has to be very parallel and things like that. Um, what we see is that if you do like you know an OpenMP operation, here's a barrier, here's a reduction, and here's a parallel uh, launching a set, you know parallel four region. If you do it on one thread on one core, it takes you know, let's just look at the barriers. It takes 0.1 microseconds. As you go down to more and more cores, right, bring more and more cores into the barrier, it takes a lot longer. So if you say go from four cores uh, threads to 256 threads, you go by a factor of 10 in the cost of doing that barrier. And what we saw was this actually scales as the square root of the number of threads. Um, 
that's actually probably not the best that Intel could do. They could probably do more of a log two dependence, and they may have. They said they were going to make updates to this, so um, I haven't gone back to check. But the idea is that you know throwing more cores on a system is great, but the problem is you have to coordinate them, and as you throw more cores on the system, this coordination gets more and more expensive to the point where you know if you're trying to do parallel algorithms, you may spend more time in your barrier or in your launching your parallel region than you are actually computing, and then the cores aren't doing that much for you. Okay, so let's take a look at the tile itself. So this is the thing that I referred to as a tile, and this is a little unit of you know, architectural you know, features that contains two cores and part of the last level cache. So one megabyte of the last level cache, uh, two cores and the vector processing units attached to those cores. And it's got this little thing up here called a CHA, which is really the gateway to the mesh. So you, know, you have two cores, they both share this L2, they crunch away, if they want more data from memory, they send a message up to the um, CHA and that puts it out onto the, the mesh. And all these cores are cache coherent. So if, if anybody um, you know, has a background in computer architecture, you'll commonly see this for this MESIF um, cache coherent protocol. So that just is how, one of the problems you run into is you have all this data that now ends up scattered across all the caches on all these cores across the whole chip. And so if you want a piece of data, where is it? Is it in the memory? or is it in one of the caches somewhere? And we have not just an L3 or an L2 cache, but an L1 cache. And so someone has to keep track of where all this data ends up. And that gets its own, get, has its own world of complexities um, that, that make it hard to scale. And this is one of the areas that sort of is very limiting in terms of scaling a multi-core architecture. Uh, and so it's important to do it right. And this is one of the things that the GPUs kind of jettison to a degree. They don't try to do a lot of cache coherence, um, and that lets them scale a little bit better. Um, okay, so now, Let's look at the core itself. So I, earlier I mentioned this you know, ability to do multiple instructions, at, you know, parallelism by doing multiple instructions concurrently within uh, a core. And this is sort of a, a block diagram of the uh, Atom core in, that's on KNL. In particular, this is called the Silver, Silvermont variant of it. Um, I think probably most folks know, right, like if you write a C code, Fortran code, Python code, whatever, you, know, you compile it. <clears throat> or you run it and it gets compiled down into assembly instructions, right? And so these assembly instructions are basically a list of things for the core to do. And they're pretty simple, like every, you know, e people are always scared of assembly, but it's actually a really straightforward language. It's just very tedious to write long programs in them. Um, but, you know, looking at assembly, you know, you'll see things like, okay, load a data value from memory, um, add two numbers together, store a data value, uh, move a data value from one register to another. So they're all pretty simple instructions, and they all get routed into different functional units that handle those class of instructions. So commonly you'll have well, you know, memory instructions that are load store, um, integer instructions, so you're operating on integer type. So doing an integer, integer addition requires different hardware than doing floating point addition. Um, so they have specialized units for these things. So if you look here, what you'll see is um, it can do six instructions. Um, it has two integer uh, pipelines. It has two memory pipelines for doing load stores. And it has two floating point pipelines for doing floating point operations. Um, so it can do six things at once, basically. You can have six instructions sort of percolating through each of these um, pipelines. Now, one of the aspects of this architecture, though, that makes it different from a Xeon, though, is while it, in theory it can execute six instructions at once, it can only sort of pull out two instructions at a time and issue them to the cores. So you have up here at the top this fetch and decode engine, and so that's looking at the list of us, you know, your code that's sitting in this instruction cache. So just like data caches, your instructions live in these little instruction caches or in memory. And so for efficiency, they pull it into this instruction cache from memory, and that's where the chip reads it from. And it looks at it says, okay, this is a load. I'm going to send it you know, down to the memory reg uh, memory pipeline, this is an integer, I'm gonna send it down here, and it can only handle two of those at a time. So every clock cycle it can go and grab two, figure out what they are, and dispatch them. So basically on a KNL you'll get two instructions per cycle um, at best for every clock. Um, uh, and one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that the um, KNL supports four hardware threads per core. So each thread has sort of while they all share these floating point units, these memory units, and these uh, integer instruction things that actually execute the instruction, they all have their own um, registers and other bits of hardware that let the threads, uh, you know, let the processor swap between the threads extremely efficiently. So essentially the, the processor can go in and uh, fetch an instruction from one thread, send it here, and at the same time fetch an instruction from another thread and send it down here. So it can kind of mix and match and switch very quickly between these threads. But they're all using the same hardware. So four threads can't execute floating point instructions uh, necessarily faster than one thread. If one thread has 
you know, a thousand floating point instructions all ready to go with all the data and registers. The processor can just feed it through these two pipes. If you have four threads, they're still going through the same two pipes, so they really can't go any faster. Okay, um, this slide just kind of gives you some performance numbers from theta, things that we've measured. So this is just DGEM, so matrix matrix multiplication. Um, someone could try rerunning this. I don't think it's changed because basically we're hitting about 86% of peak uh, using MKL DGEM. So we're a little under uh, two teraflops for theta. So if you're running a code and you're floating point bound on theta, this is about the best you're gonna do, about two teraflops of performance. Uh, I'll say most codes are not floating point uh, performance bound these days, but it's possible you do have subsets of it are. So if you're running your code and you wanna know if it's optimal, if you're getting two teraflops, you're doing pretty well. If you're not doing two teraflops, which almost nobody ever is, um, maybe there's room for improvement. It's hard, but you, know, you might be able to do it. Um, you, what you'll see is you know, if you use 32 threads, so half the core, you get half the performance, so not surprising. Basically, you can do DGEM. Um, you know, pretty efficiently across all the cores. But once you use, you know, 64 cores, whether you use two threads per core or four threads per core, doesn't really make a difference. All these lines here, the blue one is um, one thread per core, the red one is two, and the green one is four. Um, you don't get a better performance. And the reason you don't get better performance for using more threads is what I was talking about on the last slide. They're using the same floating point pipelines. So you're just trying to shove more instructions through the same two pipelines, and, and you can't ever do more than two at a time. Um, so if you have codes that are not as efficiently written, you may see a difference between using two and four threads. Then there's other factors that come into play where that can make a difference. So if you run on theta, one of the things you want to do is you know, try your code using one thread per core, two thread per core, and four threads per core. And this is the same on um, you know, regular Xeons or ARM machines, and anything that supports multiple threads per core. Um, you might get better performance, or you might not. Um, it really, really depends a lot on what's going on. Um, so that's the, uh, the, uh, the processor. I want to take a quick look at the memory. So the memory, this is sort of a, a really simplified schematic diagram. You have a core here. The core has its L2. The L2 is connected to that 2D mesh that ultimately end up in either one of these MCD RAM in package memories or in the DDR. Um, so the in-package memory is great. It's really, really fast. It's almost 500 gigabytes per second, but we don't have a lot of it. There's 16 uh, gigabytes there, so that's all you have to work with. Um, however, we do have 384 gigabytes of DDR. However, it's you know, one-fifth as fast in terms of memory bandwidth. Um, so there's trade-offs to using these, and the idea is you know, on this chip, what you'd want to do is put the stuff that you access a lot and need good bandwidth from in the MCD RAM and the other things in DDR which is not the easiest thing to do in the world, um, especially if you don't want to change your code. So one of the things Intel did was they implemented a couple of different ways to use that fast, close memory. And one of them is just make it another cache. So you can say, I want my, you can run the machine in cache mode. So if you run on theta, one of the things when you submit to the queue, you'll often see is people running in cache mode or flat mode. And cache mode means basically take that fast memory, I don't know how to program it, I don't want to worry about it, and just use it as a last level cache and the system will take care of that for you. So you have your CPU here, it makes a memory request. That first, it checks to see if it's in the in-package uh, MCD RAM. If it's there, great, you get it really quickly. If not, well, it has to go out to the DDR. And, you know. But then it comes and lives there, so if you access it again, you know, next time you do, it'll be fast. If you don't wanna do that, and you say, hey, I know there's specific data I wanna have live in the in-package memory, because I know I need a lot, you can run the machine in flat mode. And that will give you two memory spaces, and you'll have to allocate data specifically in the in-package memory or the DDR memory. And you can do this using JE malloc or memkind libraries. Um, there's also a, a, like a, uh, a command line command called NUMA CTL that can set the default. So if you do a malloc, it'll, you can say, I want it to go here or here. Or you can use pragmas that will let you set. And for people that are indecisive and don't know which one they want, you can do hybrid, which just means I'll take a little bit of both. Uh, this shows the performance we see on Theta for the stream benchmarks. So if folks aren't familiar with stream, it's kind of one of the standard ways that people report memory bandwidth on machines. And essentially it's just doing like a DAXB, so you know, uh, vector-vector so vector uh, addition. So load two numbers, one from each array, add them together and store them. So two loads in a store. Um, if you do that, what you'll see is um, you get the numbers I reported earlier, about 485 gigabytes per second uh, from MCD RAM and then um, 90 from DDR. Now, it's actually a little more complex than that because you can do these things called streaming stores or non-streaming stores. And streaming stores are an Intel architectural 
instruction that lets you skip the caches. It sort of says, don't, don't ever cache this stuff. And in some cases, that can help you. And in some cases, it can hurt you. So here, it helps a little bit. In other cases, it hurts. Um, but I, I won't dwell too much on this. But the main thing is, you know, memory bandwidth is probably one of the most codes these days, or I say a significant fraction of code see severe memory bandwidth limitations. This is one of the harder things. Um, it's easy to put a lot of, well, I shouldn't say easy. It's, People can and have successfully put a lot of transistors on a chip. Getting data in and out of a chip is a bigger challenge. Um, and you know, one of the reasons is you really only have, for external memory, how much data you can move in and out depends on how many lines or channels you have coming in and out. And that really is dependent on just how many pins you can connect to the chip and how much perimeter around the chip you have to connect to memory. And there's only so much of it you have. Um, and so that really limits the bandwidth. And so this is something that I would say, if you're working with your code, there's a better than even chance that your problem is not floating point performance, it's memory bandwidth. Um, so you want to look, you know, at least make a point of looking at some point, you know, if you look at flops, also look at memory bandwidth to see how you're doing. And you might often find that your memory bandwidth limited, in which case you want to see if there's something you can do to better utilize the caches in the system to give you better performance. Um, in addition to bandwidth, everybody talks about bandwidth a lot in the context of memory. Um, there's another important feature of memory, which is latency, which is basically how long does it take, if I ask for a piece of data, how long does it take to get back to me? Um, and what you'll see here is these are values measured on theta. Um, if you ask for a piece of data and it finds it in the L1 cache, it takes four cycles. So if you're waiting for that data, you have to wait four cycles before you can do anything. Four cycles, not so bad. That's 3.1 nanoseconds. I mean, you're losing some time, but you know, it's, it's not as bad as if you're going to DDR or MCD RAM. So you'll notice uh, once you get out to DDR and MCD RAM, you're talking order 200 cycles. And so every time you have to wait to execute something for data to come back from MCD RAM or DDR, you're waiting 200 cycles. That means you're running at like you know, one half of 1% of the you know, issue rate of the machine uh, in terms of flop performance or instruction issue if you're always waiting on your data to come from um, MCD RAM or DDR. So, so how you use the memory hierarchy is very important for your application. Um, and every machine has a slightly different one, but this idea of like, you know, the caches are fast and close, and you know, um, memory is far away and slow is, is kind of common. Okay, um, so that's um, all I'm gonna say about the chip itself. I do wanna take a minute or two to look at the network, because as I said, this is a critical piece of any HPC system. Um, so on Theta, we have Craze, Aries, Interconnect. Uh, the Aries Interconnect works by having these uh, Aries uh, router chips, and each Aries router chip is connected to uh, four Xeon Phi. In this case, there's just one uh, socket, but to four nodes. All right, so they each feed data into this Aries router chip, and then there's you know 40 some odd ports coming out of this that connect to other pieces of the network. So you send data from your node into the Aries, and then it pops out one of these gray boxes, and it goes somewhere else on the network. And there's a routing algorithm that figures out where that goes. And that, how that routes and how that gets to the other place is related to the topology of the network. Now, there's a lot of network topologies that people have used over the years. Uh, Factory is one of the most common ones. Uh, BlueJean had these 4.5D Tauruses. Uh, and Cray is using one of the more commonly utilized ones these days called Dragonfly. And the, the idea of Dragonfly is it's a hierarchical all-to-all um, arrangement. So if you take a single group, so Theta has 12 groups, that means all the processors in Theta live in one of 12 groups. Within that group, you have a 2D sort of grid of nodes, and it's 16 by 6. And if you want to send data from this node to, say, this node, it's all-to-all -all connectivity, so there's a separate lane it's not hops, but there's a separate lane that just takes you immediately from this node to that node with nothing in between. And so your data gets there nice and quick, and there's no room for traffic or interference. And so that's great. You, know, you can hop from here to here, no interference, and very quickly. But if you want to get up here, well, there's no direct route, but you can do two hops. So you can hop from here to here. And so this is kind of a 2D all-to-all -all configuration within the local group. So we have 12 of these groups, so that's great. You can talk to everybody pretty efficiently with a lot of bandwidth and with minimal hops within a group, but how do you get your data from group to group? Well, basically from every point in this grid, there's links coming out from one group that go to another group. So if I want to send data, say, from this group to this group, let's say it comes from this processor, I'd hop over to the guy that has a link that goes from here to here, and then once I get to here, I sort of leave my group and I go to the next, the group that I want to go to. And then within that group, I might arrive here and let's say I want to end up over here, I then have to do uh, two hops to get over there. So that's the um, Dragonfly topology with a you know, 2D all to all uh, configuration within the local group. And um, 
when you're running on these things, for most users, what you care about is not so much the topology or the routing protocols, but what's my performance, right? And so you'll get talks from the MPI guys and uh, other folks. And I just want to give you some numbers that we measured on Theta. So this is um, you know, measured using the OSU benchmarks, MPI, point-to-point -point latency. And you'll see latency um, for a one-byte message is a little under uh, four microseconds. Now, if you remember memory, band, uh, memory latency, it was four nanoseconds for the L1 cache. So, and 200 nanoseconds for main memory. So we're talking, you know, a thousand times slower to get data from another node than it is from your L1 cache and whatever, you know, 200 times or 20 times slower than from your local memory. And you can see that, you know, one of the things we did was we uh, looked at kind of different configurations of communicating pairs with pairs on the same node or close to each other with zero hops and as far away as we could put them on the system. And there's really no difference. It doesn't matter how close they are physically on the network. Um, there's very minimal difference and only, you can only kind of see it down here at the you know, small message size. Um, but you know, as you send more and more data, you, know, you have a fixed sort of um, base latency and as you send more and more data, it takes longer. Uh, and what we saw was that you, know, you can kind of model this pretty well by a, a time model saying like, well, there's a base latency of alpha plus a cost per byte that you send and that gives you kind of this um, orange line that models the performance of the network and you have this kink and I'll let you guys, I'll just mention that there's, there's this weird kink in the middle that's due to what MBI is doing since it's a message patching protocol or uh, programming model and it switches from eager to rendezvous so you can ask the MPI guys you know, more about that. But the switch kind of has implications here. If you use an MPI one-sided um, operation, it doesn't have this little kink and it stays pretty close to the model. Um, but this is the sort of performance you see on Theta or MPI. And real quickly, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip over this. But basically, we can see about 12 gigabytes per second of bandwidth off the node. And then MPI barriers, um, similarly, we can simplify, uh, model them with a simple equation, which basically says the time to do a barrier is some fixed amount of time plus some dependence on the number of ranks you have in your, your communicator. And here it's a log two dependence, which is better than what we saw with OpenMP, which was square root dependence. Okay, and I'll, I'll skip over the broadcast. So, so Mike talked, and, uh, so that was Theta. I wanna move on in the little bit of time I have left to Aurora. Um, I can't say a lot about Aurora because we're still in the process of deploying Aurora and a lot of the information, unfortunately, is still under NDA. Um, Mike, I think, mentioned most of this, but it's gonna be an exaflop system in 2021. It's gonna have Intel XE GPUs and create slingshot network. So I wanna talk a, bit, a little bit about Intel GPUs. So I think most people here in HPC know that uh, if you look at the top 10, NVIDIA GPUs are you know, gaining a lot of traction. A lot of the top 10 machines in the top 500 have in, uh, NVIDIA GPUs in them. So you know, there's something going on that's working well with these GPUs. And Intel's actually been making GPUs for a long time, I'd say a, a, about a decade. Uh, but they don't make them as discrete devices. It's not something you can like put on a separate card and play with. It's actually integrated into the processor. And this is the floor plan for um, an Intel Core i7 processor. And that shows you the four CPU cores, the connection to memory, and then the integrated Intel GPU. And you can see that actually the GPU takes up about as much space and I'm guessing it takes up, uses about as many transistors as the four cores do. So it's not a small, trivial piece of hardware. It's actually a reasonably substantial piece of hardware. It's just not quite as big as you would get with NVIDIA and things like that. Um, so they've been doing this for a long time. They're currently on what they call their Gen 9 GPU. Um, you can tell that this didn't get a lot of attention because it didn't get a cool marketing name. They just called it Gen 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is named by engineers, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, then the marketing guys got into the loop and they said, no, that's too simple. We're going to call it this funny X to the E thing. Um, so that's the new name for what would be Gen 12. And Gen 12 is going to be both integrated onto devices like you see today, and also on discrete devices sort of of the caliber of what NVIDIA is building in, you know, or will be building in the same time frame. And um, I can't talk about the Gen 12 much, but I can talk about the Gen 9 a little bit. I, I, you'll get other talks about GPUs, so I won't go into a lot of details. But, um, you know, this is sort of the same diagram, but it shows you how things, or the, conceptually the same diagram, but it shows you a little bit of how things are connected. So you have your cores here. You have your memory controllers over here and all the things that go off the chip. And then there's this ring interconnect. So this is a sort of simpler version of the mesh, right? You know, fewer cores, they went with a simpler interconnect called a ring. 
Um, and that connects to this graphics device over here. And they all share the same memory and they actually share the same last level cache, which is nice when it's integrated. The downside is they really haven't put an emphasis on performance on these machines, at least for double precision. So you know, if you use one of these Gen 9s, you're looking at one to 300 gigaflops of peak performance depending on the configuration. Um, now if you look at the, the, the GPU architecture itself, the thing that you would find at the very bottom that's sort of most analogous to a core is called an execution unit. And the execution unit is essentially a core, right, where it has these multiple pipelines. So these send ones are memory, um, where memory instructions go. These branch ones handle, you know, code branches. And then the SIMD floating point units basically handle everything else. So you have two SIMD floating point units, a uh, branch unit and a send unit. <clears throat> and um, connected to that, they have seven threads. So on the Xeon uh, Knight's Landing, we had four threads on this, this particular GPU, we have seven. One of the reasons they have seven is because they have less cache and less other things that can avoid stalls in the pipelines over here. And so they have more threads of things, more threads of instructions. So if one thread gets blocked, you go on to the other thread and you find another one that's got something to do. Each thread um, has 128 uh, registers that are 32 bytes long. So that's a 256 bit you know, register. Uh, so that's a fair number of registers. It's more than you see on a Xeon. Uh, today. And so the idea is this is sort of the, the base level piece of Intel's um, GPU architecture. And to a large degree, it looks a lot like a very, very simple core, right? So you have these instruction pipelines. Now, one of the things that is different is if you run on a Xeon, Xeon has all this machinery to keep the core busy, all this order, out of order execution unit stuff so that if, you know, if it gets to an instruction, and it can't issue it, it looks up the chain and finds another one, and if it's not sure if it can run it or not, it'll issue it speculatively, and it turns out that it was wrong, it'll cancel that and rewind, and it does all this stuff to kind of keep the core going um, and executing instructions as quickly as possible. But that comes at a price of power and transistors, and so this architecture is sort of like, hey, let's throw that all away, let's do something relatively simple, but let's just have a lot of things we can work on, and if there's one thread that gets stalled, we'll just move on to the next thread, and you know, work on that one until the one that was stalled is ready to go again. So that's sort of the, the base of it. Now, the idea between G, uh, you know, Intel GPUs and I think GPUs in general is now you just want to compose a lot of these guys together, right? So you get your performance by putting a lot of these on the chip. And so this is what Intel's done here in their Gen 9 is you can buy Gen 9s today integrated on where you have um, you know, eight EUs connected in a subslice. And it's sort of a subslice is the basic building block of you know, where they compose these things. And so a subslice has you know, sort of other machinery like caches and um, act, you know, the actual connection to memory. And then you take these subslices and you compose them into slices. And then you can have as many slices as you know, they feel like building. So they could have one, two, or three slices in their Gen 9 architecture. Actually, they could have as many as they want, most likely. They just make products with one, two, or three. And that's what gets you the performance. Um, so I think I've kind of, yeah, just about reached the end of my time. Um, so hopefully in the future, you know, we'll be able to talk a lot more about Intel's, you know, new architecture. I would say, you know, they've named them Gen 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 for a reason that they're mostly generations, right? They're evolving. They're not, and there's not a big jump that I've seen in any of their product lines between, let's say, Gen 9 and the future ones. So they're, they're carrying over a lot of, um, you know, their architectural features into the future. Um, one of the things with GPUs is, you know, the hardware is interesting, the programming models are even more interesting. And for people that work with applications, this is probably the thing that's going to be most challenging for them. Uh, because as we move forward, you know, a couple of years ago, you had basically two options if you wanted to run on GPU. CUDA, well, a few years back, you really pretty much only had CUDA. Then along came OpenCL, and then they added OpenACC. So if you wanted to run on GPUs, these were kind of your options. Most people chose CUDA or OpenACC. Going forward, we have GPUs from Intel coming on market, we have AMD GPUs, and we have NVIDIA GPUs. And so the space of heterogeneous programming is getting much more crowded and much more complex, and we're seeing prol proliferation of programming models. So we have CUDA, OpenCL, which has been around for a while, HIP, which is coming out of AMD, which is sort of their answer to CUDA, and is very similar. Uh, OpenMP is sort of adopting most of what's in OpenACC, so now you can use Open a OpenMP in the way you would have used OpenACC. There's newer things coming out that are sort of rooted in C++. There's one called Sickle. Sickle is coming out of the same group that did OpenCL, um, the Kronos group that standardized OpenCL, but it's for uh, C++. 
And then there's things coming out of DOE called Coco Samraja that are kind of similar in flavor to a degree to co uh, Sickle. But uh, for programmers, this is both interesting and challenging because you have a lot of options, but the problem is there's no guarantee that all those options will work everywhere. Um, so I, I have a feeling there will be a shakeout over the next few years and people will have to decide. People like you will have to decide which ones they like the best and implement their code. And sort of the most people that do that you know, for a programming model, that's the one that wins and the ones that go for it. Um, so with that, I'll stop and uh, take any questions. I, yeah. um, on the memory latency side, the mm. MCD RAM has more cycles and uh, a greater latency in terms of time than the DDR. Is that, is that expected? Yeah, I mean, it, it's an aspect of how this particular implementation is. I don't think it needs to be that way. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a memory architect, but you know, Intel is very clear up front that, yeah, that's, that's how it is. Part of it is because of the complexity. They have that cache mode in there, and I think there's some machinery that you know, gets in the way. I, I, I couldn't give you all the details, but they have given us explanations. So yeah, latency is hard to, latency is hard to beat. So even with fast memory close, you still end up with a decent amount of latency. Uh, yeah. Going forward, what do you suspect is going to be the best option for targeting multiple accelerator architectures? Because OpenACC is like great and fantastic to use, but it seems like, you know, Cray is going to stop supporting it. And it seems like it's kind of, Dying. Like, do you think OpenMP yeah. is just where people are going to move? More people seem to be moving to OpenMP. I'll, I'll say that trying to predict programming models and what people will be using 10 years from now is like trying to, you know, pick what stock's going to do the best in the stock market. If I knew what programming model was going to be doing great, I wouldn't be here. I'd be on a yacht somewhere. Um, so uh, I can't say with any certainty what, you know, which one would be the best. But I, it does seem the trend is moving away from OpenACC. But OpenMP is still very new, and the implementations are very immature. So... Um, it'll be a while before we understand how that shakes out. Um, you know, it, it's a tough question, and I don't have a great answer. Uh, I think I maybe can take one more question, and then I got... Did you have a... Yeah. Um, my question was actually kind of similar, which was that I had heard a few years back that the thing about GPUs is that, um, like, scientific computing is not a big part of the market for companies that make GPUs, and so I'm a little bit confused about, like, you know, is our preference about what language we use really going to um, be the determining factor, or will it be like who is actually going to be supporting and um, maintaining the language and stuff like that? Um, I, so for the overall hardware market, HPC is not the center. I mean, DOE is spending, I don't know, several billion dollars on hardware, and a lot of that's going to GPU. So it, 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 GP, it, HPC is important in the hardware market, but it's not the dominant factor. I mean, it may be, I don't know what the ratio is. Maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 10, but it's enough that they pay attention. It's not so much that we get to dictate what they do. Um, the programming models, though, these are all programming models meant to help you do what you're trying to do. So these things, you know, these things here on this list, ultimately, yeah, it will be HPC programmers predominantly that I think will decide what, 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 what the winners are here. So they will listen to, you know, this is an area where we have a lot of sway. And so the concerns that people have, you know, you should talk to the folks um, and, and, you know, it will have a big influence on what gets done.